Um, so I'm Sarah Chapman, and I'm the executive director of the nonprofit Media Burn Archive, which is based in Chicago. Media Burn collects, produces, and distributes documentary video created by artists, activists, and community groups. Our mission is to use archival media to deepen context and encourage critical thought through a social justice lens. Um, tonight's event is part of an ongoing free series called Virtual Talks with Video Activists, which creates conversations surrounding the way that media production can spark social change. Tonight's event is in partnership with both the Department of Cinema and Media Studies at the University of Chicago and the Video Data Bank at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. So I'm gonna just do a little bit of housekeeping um, and then we are going to play the video and after that, there will be a Q and A. So um, while we are playing the video, if everyone could just make sure to stay muted so that we can all hear the video as well as possible, that would be great. Um, once the, the Q and A starts, our um, wonderful moderator, Stephen Gong is gonna come on and start up the discussion with um, Janice and David, Janice Tanaka and David Gallardo, the filmmakers um, who created Hop, No Hop Sing, no, no Bruce Lee are with us tonight. So there will be a discussion with them and um, we would love for you to ask all of your questions and you can do that either in the chat or you can use the raise hand feature on, on Zoom and uh, we will call on you and you can say it out loud, whichever, you would prefer. Um, we want this to be a really robust and productive discussion. Um, and so the event is going to be recorded, just the discussion portion of the event. Um, and so tonight will be the only way you can see no hot seeing no Bruce Lee. And if you like, would like to see it um, again later to use it for a class or a screening, you should get in touch with the video data bank at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, the distributor. So I think that is all I need to say. Um, and with that, we will watch um, the video. It's uh, 28 minutes long, and then there will be the discussion. So thank you for joining us and enjoy. In my early teens, when asked if I had a choice between a Caucasian or an Asian man, which would I choose? A white man, of course, I answered without hesitation. Through my peripheral vision, I caught the look on my younger brother's face. I felt miserable unable to understand why or where these feelings came from. This preference was echoed years later by my daughter, who prefaced her statement with, I don't know any Asian males. She too has a younger brother. You really are most of them. Laws that kept Asians beyond the protection of the Constitution is a clear indication of the undesirability of Asians, except when cast in servile dead. roles. Silent, sexless, obedient houseboys and mystic martial art masters are the images propagated by this culture's mass media. And although I remember cringing when I saw Ito, Auntie Mame's houseboy, giggle, scrape, and bow in embarrassing humility, recall being puzzled by Mr. Moto's Hungarian accent, and self-consciously laughing at Cato's fanatical lunge at Inspector Clouseau, I was blind to the effects these images had on my father, my brother, my son, or myself. Consciously unaware, I was unable to ask why films with seemingly empowered Asian male characters are played by white male actors, and in one case a white female actor, while weak, subservient Asian male characters are portrayed by Asian actors. These choices are indefensible, the images offensive, the emotions they evoke confusing. By adapting to pressures of assimilation, by assuming the posture of invisibility and silence, we unconsciously deny recognition of differences in representation. Okay, very good, everyone. Uh, hi, I'm Stephen Gong. I'm the executive director of the Center for Asian American Media in San Francisco, although I'm joining you from my home in Oakland, California, as we are all, of course, still trying to be very careful. I'll be moderating the Q&A uh, for the remainder of uh, our time today. And um, I do invite you to, uh, as Sarah mentioned, please put any questions you have in the chat and I'll try to get to them. And uh, if you would like to uh, speak or question out, raise your hand and someone will help, hopefully help uh, uh, me identify you when we can do that. But I'll, I'll just start with a little bit of an introduction of our two other guests, the uh, producer, director, and artist of this work, Janice Tanaka, and also the co-director, uh, David Gallardo. 
Uh, Janis Tanaka began in the performing arts with the Allegro American Ballet Company. She studied music composition at the Conservatorio Internacional de Musica and performed in theaters, nightclubs, and television throughout the Americas. In 1979, she built an analog computer for processing video. And as a visual artist, her work is influenced by these early experiences, evidenced in the rhythmic kinetic compression of her images and content, which attempts to unravel the complexities of human nature while examining the social implications of cultural dictums. Her extensive list of national and international exhibitions includes many museums, arts festivals, and contemporary art spaces. Her work is included in the permanent collections of also a wide range of uh, museums, including the Carnegie Museum of Art, the Getty, the Japanese American National Museum, the Institute of Kino Engineers in St. Petersburg, Russia, and the University of Chicago. From 1994 through 97, she was a software developer designing CD-ROM games, and from 1979 to 98, an artist in residence in Sony Electronics Professional Division of Illinois. She has published broadly in arts journals and her work is distributed by the Video Data Bank, Electronic Arts Intermix, Women in the Director's Chair, my organization, CAM, and VTAPE in Canada. And uh, I, Janice also mentioned, I think she's teaching at Cal, uh, Cal Arts. Thank you, Janice. I thought that's what it was. Okay. Uh, and, and I'd also like to introduce David Gallardo, a senior project manager of transmission for remote live to air broadcast services with PSSI Global Strategic Television. He is a graduate of NYU's Tisch School of the Arts film program, a former cameraman and field audio engineer, a photography enthusiast with an emphasis in lighting, and a formal former, I don't know how you could be former though, don't you always stay skilled? Former martial artist of Capoeira and Wushu. Mm -hmm. He is a world traveler, a former resident of Kyoto, Japan, and now a proud Angelino of 25 years. David is also the son of Janice Tanaka. And that's our introduction. And um, I did also want to acknowledge and, and thank you all for joining us today. And I see a number of, of friends and fellow travelers in the media, from the media arts world for a number of decades. And I do hope we'll hear from, from you and you can share and shed some light on uh, the conversation. Um, Stephen, actually, there's one of the interviewees um, here, Alex Liu. Is, oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Janice, for pointing that out. Hi, Alex. Hi, Stephen. Hi, everyone. Thanks for Good having to see me. You. Yeah, and Alex, be sure and you you join in too as uh, as mm -hmm. as as the time comes, or you know, raise your hand if we if you want to make sure and have some reminiscing to do with us. I see Dee Dee and Tom, and I mean, this is really, this is quite a nice gathering. Uh, um, anyway, I won't, I won't call all, all, all my old uh, warriors out on this. I do hope there's some younger uh, students though also. So I know that, you know, I, I think what we want to make sure we get to today is to connect this work with what's happening in the world today. You know, clearly, um, you know, what can we say? The American democracy is, is kind of broken and, and the anti-Asian hate is, is ever present. And I do believe we, we all, uh, I think, can make these connections between representation, stereotyping, the othering of minority groups. And, and, uh, and I do wanna make sure we touch on that, but I, I wanted to start uh, because because so many of you are involved in the media arts or studying it or helped create the field. I did want to start uh, for, for the benefit of, of some younger folks um, with, with trying to place where this work is and where Janice's work is. I've been a, an admirer of Janice's work for many, many years or decades, let me say. And you know, what I thought was always so interesting is um, 
even as a pioneer for Asian American representation, Janice came to this, you know, not wanting to necessarily be in the entertainment industry itself or in, in, in kind of the long form documentary field, but from this new emerging use of video technology. And as we heard from her resume, you know, really being able to combine a background in other arts disciplines in, in movement and, and then, you know, as a visual artist to build her own synthesizer. I did want to start with some of that. I mean, uh, Janice, you, you're a bit unusual that way because you also have made your work about social issues and about representation itself. You know, I, I, I highly uh, recommend, if any of you have not seen it, a videotape called Who's Gonna Pay for These Donuts Anyway, which is one of, I think, the finest works on the internment of Japanese Americans and the kind of traumatic psychic damage that was done by that experience. And, uh, and so Janice, that's one of the reasons I felt your work really, really stands apart and that helps it sort of stay relevant uh, for much longer. And I wonder if you could place for us um, some thoughts about how you came about to do this work in 1998. Wow. I don't know. Uh, I think what <laughs> I really don't. I think what happens is um, you be, you become aware on some on some level, whether it's intuitive or subconscious or conscious. Um, you become aware of of certain issues that in, bother you enough to inspire to make some type of retort um, to to a particular issue. Um, I think. Uh, I think particularly when most of my work comes from some type of personal involvement. And uh, when you see people that you love not being treated in the way that you think is fair, then it behooves you to do something about it. And um, creating the, the visual work or the, is, is the way that I, I feel I could best do something about it. And I realize that media really, has an extremely powerful um, uh, quality about it that makes you believe what you're seeing is real. It influences you, whether consciously or subconsciously, so that you begin to view the world from that particular point of view. And you asked me the other day, um, Stephen, why you know the men that were interviewed were all in media uh, of some sort, and why? And I, I thought about that, and I think it's because those were the ones that were willing to speak because they were already in media. Um, when I uh, uh, spoke to other, other people or other, other men, they, they, were, they had a lot to say, but they didn't want to say it on tape. They didn't want to make a record of it. And, and I think it's, it, it's, a, it's a form of survival, you know, to, rather than to address something in a confrontational way, you find way, um, alternative ways to skirt around it. And so I, I, I don't, uh, you know, I don't blame them for not wanting to say certain things on media. And also um, regarding how media really does influence you. Um, I'm being shot through an old camera, through a filter that is thick as a mattress. So you don't see brown spots or wrinkles or my real age. And God knows that I was born when the earth's crust was still cooling. And I like that look myself. And after I get off and I look in the mirror, I go, holy crap, when did that happen? So it, 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 it does influence you whether you're a part of it and aware of it or not. It does become part of who you are. Absolutely, thank you, Janice. Um, I, there was a question here in the chat. I, I, I think you can all see the chat too. That wanted to ask about one of the techniques, you know, the use of uh, slow motion and the and and some of your so, some of your visual uh, uh, your visual approach, your vocabulary there. One of the things I and and you know I want you to think about how you would answer that. But one of the things I guess I want to emphasize overall is that uh, again, one of the things that really impresses me about this work is that the, you don't have just one thesis. You know, the thesis isn't just, let's say that Asian actors, you know, need to, or, or Asian roles should be played by Asian actors. You let that one just be there. 
it's communicating a number, I think, of important issues. And one of them is the diversity of the Asian American experience itself and the diversity within the Asian American community. And if, you know, I'm sure you were all sort of paying attention, the number of mixed race folks, right? Filipino, Korean, Viet Vietnamese, you know, Chinese, something that we know inside the community. But again, and then without making it an overt part of a, of a thesis, you're just, you're, 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 you're letting the, them tell us in so many ways, right? How varied their experience is. So I thank you for giving, as it were giving voice to many people and making that larger point. But let's stay on, so we can go in, in either direction. I wanna open this up now actually for David and Alex to, who were subjects and approached, right? Uh, as well as Janice, if you want to remark on on that period of making it, you know what what was it when when you um, did, did you guys actively participate in in framing or shaping what you were going to say, what your background, you know what were, what you were going to be doing, or did that just happen? I I did notice a couple of scenes seemed to be outdoors where where folks were working doing martial arts work. And, and David, maybe we'll start with you just because uh, you were also a martial artist. Did you want to make that part of your representation in this piece or how did that come about? Uh, that's actually a really good question. I don't recall quite honestly, it was 23 years ago. <laughs> However, I think part of it had to do with, with uh, um, the fact that one of the other uh, people who participated, Christopher Bowers was a, uh, we, we worked out together, we we're fellow students uh, um, in the Wushu class. So that had something to do with that, I'm sure. Um, and as far as representation for how I wanted to be represented, I mean, I, I had my job and then the martial arts. I, I think actually it was probably a conscious decision because uh, as, uh, with everything, despite anything else that was going on, uh, martial arts for me at the time was, was my base. It's what uh, grounded me. So everything else around me could be crazy, but martial arts is what kept me stable. So I think that, that probably may have been a conscious decision and also because Christopher Bowers was there. Um, I, I, I think I may have chosen to be represented that way. Although later on we did have to, I did have to go into the studio for the, uh, the rest of the interview for that. So, but I did, I did want to circle back actually going around to, to, to your question to, to my mother Janice about uh, um, uh, uh, um, the, the people who she chose were mostly in media. And I, I think part of the reason why people had, and obviously we had, you know, everyone has experiences and, uh, but, in speaking about them on the record, you you potentially risk repercussions of some in some way, or or, or risk uh, not fitting in, no longer fitting in at that point. If you if you out yourself, as it were, you know what I mean. So I think that might have had something to do with it as well. Uh, why why uh, maybe people who are are, are in uh, media or the arts were more uh, open to discussing it, you know, than than uh, I had several friends who did not want to participate in this at all. So. Also, I, I remember, um, Alex, you, if you, I, I called people ahead of time and I asked them and we went down and interviewed and talked about how they wanted to be um, uh, shot or screened or what part of um, their lives did they want to be re revealed. And so it was a collaboration also with the people that performed. So I think with Alex, uh, I, I, we spoke on the phone and I went down a couple of times and we saw your, your performance and you, you, which you did in the, the house. You told me how you wanted um, things set up and I made a mistake because you talked about a thermos and I brought the wrong thing. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I totally forgot about that. Yeah, I, I remember when I saw it again, the table said, damn. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, definitely the people who were interviewed were definitely a part of, of the process. Yeah, um, Alex, any reminiscences of, yes, of your participation? Yeah, you know, it was such an, uh, an honor to be part of this project, you know, and I thank David and Janice again. And, um, you know, at that time, I had already been doing solo um, autobiographical performance for a couple of years. Uh, and then after that, pro after this project, um, I just really kind of ran with it. So I've been doing solo performance for, oh my gosh, 25 plus years, been really lucky to do it, you know? Um, and so I remember when Janice talked to me, I said, yeah, you know, I, 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 it'd be great to do that, um, to talk a little bit about it. And then the, 
the story that I told and those little excerpts of quote unquote performance were actually from one of my solo pieces um, where I portrayed my dad, I portrayed my grandfather, which is obviously not in the footage in this film, um, but it's a one man show that I've been doing all these years called Three Lives. And it's about me having to leave Saigon. Uh, I left Saigon the day it fell, uh, April 30th, 1975. Um, it was a very, very just intense day, <laughs> uh, to put it mildly. Uh, and so parts of that um, I put into my three live shows. So when Janice and I talked, I said, yeah, you know, um, I'm oh, totally open to however you want to shoot. I, I trust her implicitly. We have some really cool props. And, and I just told the story. And then she said, hey, I remember she said, hey, how about if you do some of the performance and I'll film that and then I'll, I'll have a lot to, to play with. And I was just really happy the way it came out. It, it, it was uh, it was actually quite seamless. It was kind of cool to see that. Um, and then to kind of piggyback on what Jana said earlier about, um, I didn't know that there were people who didn't who didn't want to um, tell their stories on camera. So I'm kind of glad that she she mentioned that. I, I had no idea, um, but it kind of makes sense because I think um, generally, I mean, not not. I mean, I don't want to make a blanket statement, but I think there's still that sort of taboo and there's still that sort of like shaming kind of a um, dynamic when it comes to telling our own stories in the Asian, Asian American community. Um, you know, you just don't say it, you know, you don't report things, you know, which kind of connects to what's been going on, right? With the, the anti-Asian attacks, you know, a lot of times, you know, you don't report it because you just don't want to bring attention to yourself, right? Um, and so I think there's there's definitely a prevalence of that, and I can understand why some folks didn't want to tell their stories. Um, but I'm a little bit different, and so I, I said, yeah, I mean, it, it'd be you know, if it adds to the project, absolutely. So I was just really, really um, touched and honored to 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 have been asked by Janice to be a part of it. So yeah, but it was it was a wonderful time. We had a lot of fun <laughs> doing it. Yeah. Thank you for for emphasizing that. Uh, uh, Alex, I think that's, I think you've touched on something that really resonates uh, that, that I, my understanding of, of um, how the Asian American community has sort of survived, right? Even 60 years of the Chinese Exclusion Act and, mm -hmm. and the internment and, you know, anti-communist uh, red scares. I mean, the whole history has been uh, one of Sort of, sort of uh, keeping things within the don't community. Don't make waves. Yeah, don't speak out. You get hammered. But right. you and find other ways to be able to deal with it without making too many waves. Right. Yes, <laughs> and yet, you know, I think we're at a different kind of crisis point. And and I don't want to, you know, or to me, it, it's not just about the Asian American community on its own. I think, I think this year has been so devastating right, for all of us psychically and, and for the American experiment, as it were, to, to, and much of the world, right, has been shifting into this terrible nativism, right, and fear of the other. And, and for here, you know, I do think this next generation is really, is really, to, is really wanting us all to push much more. And I think the reaction to the anti-Asian violence, the way the corporations have come out more strongly you know, on the side of Black Lives Matter, this is, I think, a, a perhaps somewhat more transformative period again that we haven't seen in decades. And in many ways, I hope so. And ah, I see Didi's going to add, let me just finish this quick thought. That Didi, then I do want to turn this over to you. But there was this question about, you know, the role that archives play, the role that, it, that a work like this and being able to have this kind of conversation is brought up. And I think they're directly related. You know, uh, the folks that made this are still here with us. We have lived experiences of facing some of these images, our issues, and yet they surface, they come back in a different way and they affect all of us. So I, I believe this is one of the greatest purposes for having uh, ideas fixed in imagery and then having the role of the archive to be able to uh, hold and bring us back to it. Uh, so I'll stop there. And Didi, uh, please 
share well, something with us. I was just going to say how how grateful I feel to Media Burn and Tom and Sarah and Dan and I feel that um, these works are so important and so glad to see Janice's work. I, I always was very struck with Janice in a way she would integrate like archives but also experimental video in, a, in an amazing way and um, and it, that's the kind of thing that in the late 70s we were fighting for getting independence on on public television and, uh, and we we went to Congress and and uh, had uh, 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 some success but I, I think we're back where we need to do that again, because I think that the fact that, that Ken Burns is going to uh, cover diversity, he's going to do the next, his next series is on diversity. It's like, what is that? And, and to me, it's not just diversity of races, diversity of ideas, but also diversity of formats. And to me, Janice so exemplifies the, the, the way that she puts together her, her wonderful pieces in this, uh, with, with humor, always humor, and, uh, and, 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 and such uh, creative. I, I, it was interesting to me to learn that she started in ballet. I can see that in her work. Thank you very much, Dee. Thank you, Dee. Uh, yeah, I appreciate, so yeah. appreciate that viewpoint. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, there was there's an interesting one here about um, contrasting the relative immaturity of American culture against the deep maturity of Asian cultures. You know, I I I wonder. Well, I should let the I should let. Uh, uh, Janice, you try, uh, and let me let me shape it to something that I've been curious about. Now, understanding your own background, did you feel, to what extent did you feel that you were educated and and working in a Western European tradition? At at what you know, how much of your work did you feel that you're influenced by you know more of an uh, an Asian art tradition. Um, wh where where do you sit on that kind of issue about your influences? I grew up in Chicago in an all white neighborhood. So I have these very strong white filters over my eyes and um, growing up in that particular time um, in an all white neighborhood, my life was a living hell. So <laughs> So you learn how to, to deal with it on, uh, and make fun of, of it and yourself. Um, when I, when I, um, I ran away from home when I was 17, as soon as I graduated high school. And um, that actually that's when I joined the, the ballet company. And then I left them um, and went in my early 20s and went to Mexico. And um, because even in ballet, it was a lot of... Um, racism, not necessarily against uh, the, 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 the face, but against the, the, the form. The, it, I don't have a European body. The legs are too short, the trunk is too long, so on and so forth. So they did all kinds of special cutting on my costumes to um, make my body look more European. Um, but I went to, um, when I went to uh, Latin America and, and settled in Mexico, Mexico City, um, they used to call me de la raza fina, and it was there that I started getting a sense of myself. There was a very small Japanese community there um, that I would occasionally go to to buy buy things that you know food wise that I would I would make that were was familiar to me. Um, but it was very different. It was an, an, it adapted itself at, at to um, Latin life, and I found that it was much less discriminated against because they used to always call me the la raza fina of the finer race. And so when I so I set, lived in Central and South America for seven years, coming back to the states, um, I, I was my identity was so mixed because my mother was traditional. 
The place that I grew up was not, it was Caucasian. Where I found myself was Latino. So it was this constant mix of all of them that I felt that, um, and, and the, the first time that I experienced a large Asian, Asian population, I was 17 and met a friend at a place that I worked and she invited me to a basketball game and, and I felt uncomfortable because they all looked Asian. <laughs> And I, when, we, when we went to the bathroom and I looked in the mirror and all these young Asian faces, young women, I looked like them. And for some reason, it was a shock. It was an absolute shock. So all of that, it's not that, I, that I'm coming from a particular Asian background. I think I'm coming from a pretty much mixed ethnic background from all the experience. So um, my experience, um, has to do, or the work that I have has to do, and I think all of our, um, our, our prejudice and things that we like or we don't like really have to do with experience and exposure. Um, without all of them, you, you become isolated into a very limited mindset. So my feeling is, is that in the same way that I looked uh, at Asians as strange, even though I looked at them, I understand that. What I don't, or, or when I was in, um, I, I was in the outback in Australia, and I looked at the aboriginals, and I, they look strange to me. Or when you go into a, a whole area of handicapped people, in the beginning, it's shocking and it looks strange to you. I think what the mistake that we make is that we attribute certain types of attributes to to a particular that looks strange, and it's never it's never a positive one, like oh, that person looks strange. They must be incredibly intelligent and wonderful or they must be able to adapt really well. No, it's instantly something of, of a negativity. And that, that part is it's what's wrong. And I think because I, did, I was fortunate enough to travel quite a bit and I saw my own awkwardness in, in new situations. In fact, I've learned to say now whenever I go to some place that I'm not familiar with is I'm not that familiar with their culture. I know I'll make mistakes. Please correct me and I apologize ahead of time. But you don't, you don't attribute something negative to them because you, know, I, uh, you don't understand it. You know, it, it, it behooves one to really look beyond what they feel is the superficial or, or, or different. So I feel quite strongly about that. And that just seemed to become part of the message of the work that I created. Thank you, Janice. Good. There's a question in here about the representation of Asian uh, men and Asian Americans. And, and in a sense, you know, how far we've come or not. And perhaps mm -hmm. Alex, who's a, still a performing artist can, can weigh in on this. I, we, we get questions a lot, you know, it seems to me Every, five, every seven years, there would be a mini cluster of films about Asian Americans, you know, and Ang Lee sort of did um, Crouching Tiger, you know, um, and then, then people would sort of say, have we, have we reached a kind of, a, you know, a, a important moment and then it would fade away. And, and we got a lot of this around Crazy Rich Asians. And it reminds me in a little bit of what Dee, Dee brought up. You know, I think if, if your background is coming more from independent media, you realize, you know, it doesn't really matter too much if you're still talking about real entertainment media, that they're just as cardboard as one the other and ethnicity is just an e exotic flavor. Um, and in a sense, I think we're holding out for something a little more meaningful and deeper. Uh, and then every so often, you know, a film like Minari comes along and if you haven't seen it, um, you know, it's, it's quite a lovely little film. And, it's, it's a modest film, but what's nice is it gets up to those tropes of uh, a narrative where you would expect a certain dramatization, you know, of the racism of white people in rural Arkansas, and it doesn't complete that. And that's what's kind of nice and refreshing. Uh, but, you know, entertainment media will be what it will be. I'm just glad that, um, that we are in this other space. I think for us at CAM, we're always trying to build out an alternative space so that, you know, uh, you, you try to push back against stereotyping by not giving into it. Uh, then finally, I guess I would say, a note for all of you who haven't seen it, there's a reference to Bruce Lee. And of course, uh, there is a series called Warrior that is uh, based on an idea that Bruce Lee 
Pat and his daughter Shannon is the executive producer and I, I tried to watch it. It, it sort of uh, exoticizes, I think, uh, Asian women in a way that's a little disturbing, but, but I am told it gets better as this series goes on. So maybe some, we have some champions of, of warrior in the group. Um, I think we have time, you know, we're a little bit over, but, it, but it, if, if you all have a question, I think we can take one or two more. No, we're, we're pretty good. I don't see anybody in there. I don't see anybody. Tom Weinberg, you got anything to share with this man? No, you're good. Um, I'm looking. <laughs> hi, Tom. Hi, hi. Well, you were talking about the 70s and the late 70s. And the first time I met Janice was when she had a, a, a piece that I saw for the first time, which was about internment and her family. And it was something that I had never seen before or depicted that way. And we put it on TV a couple, several times, I think, uh, in, in Chicago. And um, I think this, what we've just seen is, is mind blowing in its own way uh, because it, it opens up. It opens it up without saying. Here's without forcing you to understand. You know, to shoving it down your throat or something. It's there, and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, it's great to see you. <laughs> it's great seeing you too. Um, this is the man that started my career. Thank you so much, Tom. Well, I was still a graduate student. Yeah. Thank you. I have one other question. Eleanor wants to know how do you get that filter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this this is an old 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 laptop i need to buy a new one it, it they're no longer even making it. it's a it's a sony vio and it's the the camera is so old that even if i had the filter up really really sharp or without a filter i'd still look pretty damn good but then on top of it zoom has a filter on it that you put and then, of course, there's makeup. And then from being in, in media, I know how to light myself. So I'm surrounded by aluminum foil <laughs> to, reflect, to reflect the desk lamp. Anytime, Eleanor, I'll come over and help you out. <laughs> that would be good. Yes, mine would work. And then someone needs to say it. Asians don't raisin. So, you know, you're, you're got some, you start out good. <laughs> Okay, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been a real pleasure for me. And I want to thank Janice for making this, uh, David for being here, Alex for joining us, all thank of you. you for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All good. Yeah, thank you so much, Stephen, for moderating. You did an excellent job. And thank you so much, Janice and David, for being here tonight. It was such an honor. And thank you to Levi Henke for handling the tech and to um, Zach Vaines and Tom Colley at Video Data Bank for um, making the, the video available to us. And if you want to um, show this film in your classes or do a screening of it, you should get in touch with Video Data Bank about renting it. So thanks everyone again. Um, join us in two weeks for um, Mayday video from the Video Freaks, 1971, huge protest in Washington, DC. It's the 50th anniversary. So we're gonna be really excited to be showing that video. So take care and good night. Good night. Thank, thank you so thank much, Katie. Thank, thank, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Thank you, uh, thank you, so much, thank you Sarah. Thank, thank you, Tom. Ben. Hi. Uh, thank you, Barbara, um, <laughs> uh, Maria, jo uh, John, uh, Anna, and uh, um, Mariella, and let me see, um, Rafael, Ola, um, Charles, um, Karen, Kathy Huffman, Nancy, um, Irene, Zachary, Thomas, I'm trying, just trying to get everybody in. Steve Rabbits, Matan, thank you so much. Matan, give me a, um, a, a call later and I'll answer your question. Same thing with you, Jonathan. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Thanks, Janice. David. <laughs> hey, Raphael, look at you, good looking guy. <laughs> thank you. Hey.